Welcome to Discovering. It's 2020 and we're ready to roll. Tonight, we're back with John and Victoria Youngworth to check on the progress of our birch bark canoe project. Now we've added, this is called a side panel. You don't really need a saw, but you do need to understand how wood behaves. Sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan This is a root that's been dug out of the ground and um, we roll them up like this just to store them and then soak them so that they're soft and then you can unwrap them. And um, a lot of the canoe is held together with, these are spruce roots and a lot of the canoe is held together with roots because there really aren't any other kind of fastenings. So all of these roots have to be split and peeled. I usually split them first because if they don't split properly, you haven't wasted a whole bunch of time trying to peel them. And the roots come in all different sizes. So uh, you need a selection of some of everything. There's usually a place that you can use just about anything. So then when it's split, It's peeled. So for a full-size canoe, we're going to need a several hundred feet of this. We look for trees that are in fairly sandy spots because the sandier the soil is, the easier they are to pull out. We just um, pull a few roots from each tree. We don't take a whole lot from any tree, it doesn't damage the trees. But if you dig down and get a, a root, then you can pull it for yards. You can often get really, really long ones. But once the root is peeled and split, you have to sort of uh, work on it a little bit to flatten it out. Some of them are flatter than others, but um, the flatter, the better, then they sit, you know, they sit nice on the boat. and. Here's what they look like when they're done. When we need to use them, we soak them again um, and then they're ready to go. So this is the out whale, part of the gunnel assembly. Much smaller, doesn't add so much to the strength but it makes the sandwich for the top of the bark to go in between and then the stitching goes around that part of the three-piece gunnel assembly so you can see this is the sap wood the saps get split off and carved off you really you're just using heartwood sap wood isn't worth anything it rots off but the heartwood lasts for centuries with these old cedars so you can find them laying around that's what I look for. We got a bunch of big old cedars up in the hills here. Yeah, beautiful stuff. It's like plywood with perfect grain from end to end for 20 feet that you didn't have to glue together and clamp all by yourself. Mm -hmm. 
This is a nice tool because it allows me to use two hands to do the cutting. And lets my legs do the holding. Instead of just wearing out my one arm twice as fast, I can wear out both arms half as fast. I get twice as much work done before I gotta stop. I inherited this draw knife from my grandpa's shop, which is way cool. This is a shaven horse, Ein Schnitzelbank for old German. It's a good pair of hands that you can use with your feet. And then you have all little different decks you can put on here depending on the kind of work you do. But these are not the tools of the nomad. The old ones, they grabbed these kinds of tools and technology the day after they were available. If you're on the move and you got a semi-nomadic life, then back to the one arm. One arm does the blade and the other arm is the clamp. Find a nice big old dead cedar. Hopefully it's already on the ground. It's probably big around as <laughs> your fattest uncle. And pop that in half, and if you're lucky, half of that will still be good. You want straight green, no twist. Real fussy, straight end to end. I like to be able to split a 20 foot two by two out of such a trunk. And then that's the tusk of the elephant that you carry home. So I have a stash of such splits up in the woods and just go up there and bring them down when I need them because the big tree will give you quite a few. If you're a wood right, this is what you got to have. If you don't have real good wood, then you can't split it, which means you got to put it through a machine, which means you're not a wood right anymore. Now, I like splitting wood, man. It's, it keeps this so challenging. And of course, you have to follow the grain. If you go the wrong way, you'll tear the whole thing into two and then you got to go get another one. And when you're using elephant tusks for your building materials, there aren't that many around. So you got to be smart and nice to them. So I'm doing this all one way and then I'm going to turn around and have to pull because the grain changes throughout the stick. So you, you can only cut in with, with blades like this. You can only go one way. The grain has to... Uh, you can't dig into the end of the grain or the, the blade's just going to go submarine and, and cut the thing in two. If you have a machine, machines don't care about grain. That's why you can't hardly bend a, a piece of wood that came out of a machine planer. You can see the grain there starts to go up. So if you dig in this way, it's just going to go down in. You have to turn around or you can turn the blade around, but you don't really get much power and control doing it like that. The ends of this will be split probably into four splits, probably a foot and a half up. And then at the very end, those get boiling water and they'll be bent up into that beautiful curve. Part of the signature of the maker, of the band, of people who manufactured it. So last time we had this bottom piece, which is uh, one piece of bark in place. And now we've added, this is called a side panel, and um, we've added this and stitched it in with this line of stitching here, uh, which is called saddle stitch. And it's the kind of stitch I, th I think, um, obviously they must use in saddlery. All the holes are poked with this, it's an awl. So it's a double stitch. It has to be strong enough that when the ribs get pushed in under tension and this gets really, really pressed out, this is the only thing that holds it together. So this is a double stitch. I've got two roots, one on each side, and it's going to be covered in pitch. So these actual stitches won't show. So it's a good opportunity to use up. I use up a lot of old roots and things that aren't pretty enough for the rest of the boat um, because sadly, None of this stitching is visible once we're done. Uh, but it is a very, very important part of the process. Trying to pull it as tight, as tight as we can, without breaking the roots. The roots need to stay moist or they have a tendency to, they'll break. So you have to keep wetting them and fiddling with them. Put the outwhale on, onto the the gunnel assembly, the inside part. That makes the sandwich, the two bark sandwich. And those are fastened together under, underneath those, every other one. And then I go through and trim everything down, get it all nice and rounded so the roots go over the corner nice there. 
And then Victoria comes through and does all the stitching. Okay, so these are the roots that we've peeled and split. This is basically what holds everything together. And the idea is to get it as tight as you can and have it look fairly neat at the same time. Four pairs for each one. But it depends on the root. Some roots are wider than others and it's more about just filling the, filling the space. Because once these are clamped together, it's a done deal. If your boat's good or bad, it, you won't know until the end, but it's a done deal for the, the shape of the boat now. So we have a little thin out whale, a big in whale, two layers of bark inside. And, the, and then also there's the reinforcing strip you see on the outside. And that's so that the stitching goes through two layers of bark. So when, when you put the ribs in, everything is going to stretch really big. So you want to have two layers of bark for the holes to go through so that it doesn't, the stitching doesn't pull out of the bark. Nice little Stone Age trick. And that's where the decorations go on too, once that gets trimmed up and probably do a little paint job on there. And in between the stitching is where the rib heads fit up in the little groove that was carved in the inwell in the backside. It's like a continuous bevel. And then you have to figure there's 10 ribs in between each of the thwarts and then five on the ends there. <laughs> Soaking in the creek as we got the bark to help soften it up. You know, it's probably been dry for five years. So I leave it in at least for a night or two. I'll get all the little caddis flies, damselfly babies out of there. These will be for the, this is for the end pieces on the canoe. So it's nice to have a, a really nice piece on the end there. So that's kind of the, the crowning glory of a boat. soften this stuff up with some more and more hot water really but uh, you don't want it to split in the middle of your operation Ooh, that's a bad sound you can see that in the tree there was a, a strip of wood that the bark stuck to because you know maybe had damage or something there and then all of the tubes going up and down the tree right there they were compromised. Right in the middle. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> A sigh of relief goes up. <laughs> well, actually, for this part of the job, this angled split is good because you see the it'll slope into the other bark nice. You know, it's kind of a, a tapered. Now oh, look at that. What is psychedelic? Let's give it a little memory to get it going. Nice, nice, nice. Be nice. goes inside the main part. Pull your side. That's Canoes are born in water. I suppose they probably die in the water too.
Let's get one of these splits out of here. These have been in for a few weeks. Muskrats are using it for a feeding ramp. I like wood when it's crispy and wet to split. Makes life a little easier, a little more predictable. Or if it's green right off the, the tree, it works good too. This is the cedar quarter in soaking. So see if we can, and right now I'm in need of ribs. So the whole point of this is to make a million more ribs. So this is what a wood right does. You get the tree in the woods, get the right tree, and then you know how to split it up into all the pieces that you need. You don't really need a saw, but you do need to understand how wood behaves. Already, here's the piece we want. Turn the whole big tree into that, and then we want to turn it into this, but this is the master. Two to the line. This is the coolest thing in the world, these knives. The old folks used to call that a man's knife because all the guys would have had one around. I bet you many deer got gutted with one of these because that's all they had in their pocket. But it's a one-handed draw knife, the nomad's knife. You ever go on a canoe trip in the bush, you want to take one of these with you. You could always make a paddle with that and your hatchet, at least enough to get you out of the woods. You could even fix your boat if you happen to be in a bark boat. Pull off on the riverbank find all the materials you need to make all the parts you need. Get the bottom flat and I can bring the top down to it. Doing a bevel just so you're when you pound the ribs in you won't just split off the edge and it makes it a little bit easier when you're dragging stuff around in the canoe. All right let's see how good she is. Here's the test. If it feels like that, it's like a big piece of spring steel. Then when I uh, give it the hot water treatment, it'll be marked for the width of the bottom of the canoe where it's gonna go. When this is done, take all the all 50 ribs, tie them in a big bundle and throw it in the river. One year the river, uh, we had a big rain and uh, washed all my ribs away. I had to spend the next day in the canoe going downstream finding all the ribs. That was really nice. That was the day off. Catch some fish too. <laughs>
course, winter in the UP has to include ice fishing. A fishing rod may not give you quite the exercise that you'll get from a pair of snowshoes or skis, but it's certainly a great excuse to get outdoors. Just because fall is behind us doesn't mean that the chances to hunt are gone. Get out and try some predator hunting or maybe chase some rabbits. All of these activities provide an excellent opportunity to get into the outdoors. Whether you're on snowshoes, skis, a snowmobile or simply on foot, grab a camera or your phone and hit the woods. The Upper Peninsula is loaded with great photos just waiting to be taken. To me it's a dream place to live. You know, being out in nature and, you know, just enjoying the sounds or the sights. Sometimes you forget how, how awesome it is and uh, whether it's a, you know, a simple point and shoot camera that you, you've got in your, your pocket or your bag or whatnot um, to, you know, phones or even a, a digital SLR. A tripod is, is definitely something you'd want to, you know, invest in as well. So, in regards to this year's resolutions, this list of activities may not take away the excuses for not getting out, but hopefully they'll add to the list of reasons why you should. That's it for tonight. Have a great week, and we'll see you again next Monday night right here on Discovering.